Hello, everyone. This is Ashley Pitzer, your host with Practicing Life. Today, I am interviewing my editor for my book, The Birth Challenge, and her name is Claire, Claire Cronshaw, and she is with Cherry Edits. And I'm so happy to have her on my podcast for a number of reasons. One, she was a huge blessing in my life. I had hired an editor and it didn't go really well. And she was my second idol editor. And she came in and saved the day. She saved my book. And I'm so grateful for her. So I can't wait to share all of this with you. But also too, I am now like this huge supporter of indie authors and people that are self-publishing. And I, I'm here to support you. I love on you so, so much. And I want to have my editor on here to kind of open the doors, explain anything that I see as common questions out there. I want this to be beneficial for Claire, for you. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about my book. So there's so much to this podcast. I can't wait to jump in and get started. So just a little background. I already mentioned that Claire saved me. <laughs> <laughs> so who knew that you could save somebody with a book, but you can. So I had this intention of having my book be a super easy read. And, you know, one of the things that I struggled with as a writer is like, I have dyslexia. So and it, it shows up even with switching my phrases and my words. So like my husband, when he tried to edit this or friends tried to edit this, they'd be like, you know, the end of the word, the end of the phrase needs to be tacked to the beginning. You write backwards. And so anyway, there was all of these struggles that I had and to have Claire come into my life. And she was such a bright light because she didn't make this painful for me. She made this so easy when she made suggestions. She always followed up with this is why and are you OK with this? And it was so easy. It wasn't painful. It wasn't, it wasn't an attack on my personality or the way I write. It was so pleasant. It was so easy. And I want everyone to experience this because this is how editing should feel. Like <laughs> it should feel easy. And Claire did it. And she's she's valuable to me, highly valuable. So anyway, I'm gonna open this up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I'm if I can talk for smiling, Ashley. <laughs> So I will turn this over to you. Please feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us your story. Like, how did you get started? Why did you turn in this direction? Go. Okay. Well, I'm absolutely beaming. What an introduction. <laughs> um, it's amazing to be introduced like that and to, you know, to be the person that can make a book a possibility make a book a reality for an author who spent all of this time on, on the idea uh, and then they might you know get to a stumbling block so to be able to help you out and make you I, do you feel more confident with it now Ashley do oh you feel God. yeah uh, I yeah. love it I love it I guess I would say that now you know some of the, the like so for the the audience listening when we went through like the author queries there was times when Claire put in like little suggestions of like where I could go to learn more information. And she pointed out some areas that I kind of struggled with. And so now as I'm working on book two, I'm like, I'm like, almost like, wait, I'm doing too much head hopping. And like, so I'm going back <laughs> yes. and like restructuring. <laughs> so, um, so it, it does make me more confident. It makes me more aware. And at the same time, I'm like, at the same time, I'm saying, but Claire's going to make this all right. She's going to make it all better. <laughs> Well, that's it. I, I do aim to take the stress out of the publishing journey for an author. Um, because why not? You've got the ideas, you've got the story. Now your question was kind of, what's my story? And how have I ended up doing what, I, what I've ended up doing? Now, um, I want to say that I turned 40 last year. I turned 40 last June, 40 years old. And um, for a long time, I was an employee. I am now self-employed. I am freelance. And um, this independent, autonomous phase of my life is really, really important. And in my values, in what I want to achieve in my life, it really aligns with what in independent authors are doing. So independent authors, they're striving, um, they're putting themselves out there, they are work, they are creating their own story. And I mean that both, you know, figurative, figuratively and literally, they're creating their stories. 
and we our mindsets align. So I work with indie authors. I edit, I copy edit, I line edit, I proofread for indie authors because they're my gang. <laughs> they're my people and um, our mindsets really align. Um, now, when I say that I was an employee, I was a teacher for many, many years, for 18 years, for all of my adult life, really. I came out of university. I went straight into schools, teaching in high schools. And I taught in high schools from the age of 22 up to the age of 40. Now, um, for the, between the age of 35 and 40, I was only teaching part time. Um, and in the end, it was only two days per week. Um, but you know, when I was and I was picking up the editing, I was doing my editing training first of all, and then I and then picking up actual editing work as I went on. But last year, it came to it came to the crunch where I thought, right, this is this is now, this is happening. This I only want to, moment. this is what I'm doing. I don't want to be answerable to anybody now. I want to forge my own way. I want my business to look like I want it to look. I want to work with who I want to work with. You know, me and you, we're working together because we've chosen chosen to work together. Yeah. You didn't have to work with me and I didn't have to work with you, but we wanted to work together and that's perfect. It does so. make it so much more easier. Like when you two parties are in agreement, I mean, from my personal experience, I, so my first round, when I hired my first editor, I went through, I don't know, maybe 10 different like interviewing editors. I selected one. So when I came around at the second time and then met with you, like I was a different person and more capable on how to advocate for myself. So yeah. it was so much easier because like, you knew, I asked you tons of questions to get clarity of what, and make sure that we were aligned and you yeah. were great about that. Like. So I don't understand, um, you know, people who don't put the effort into that back and forth, you know, why wouldn't you, you need to have the back and forth before you do the editing work, before you work with an author or else that edit is not going to go well. It's, it's got to be a collaboration. You have, I was going to use the cliche, you have got, you've got to be on the same page, <laughs> pardon the pun, but you do. Um, so I think that we both did the work before the actual edit itself to make sure that we were the right team. Yeah, I knew exactly what you were offering before I signed the contract. And it gave me a lot of peace of mind. And it made it really easy to hand over my manuscript that you were going to have for six weeks and I wasn't going to see it all. <laughs> I know. I understand that. And actually, Ashley, you were quite unusual in the way that you came to me compared to um, a lot of the other authors that I work with, because for a lot of the other authors, we were connected on social media, on LinkedIn particularly, or okay. Facebook via various Facebook writing groups or that kind of thing. And they've had chance to check me out first, chat to me, um, you know, get used to me and then they will approach me for an edit. Whereas um, when you email, we, we just went email, didn't we, to start with? Yeah, yeah. But we did, but it was, it, it was back and forth. Um, so I'm not, so I'm not surprised that you probably felt nervous to hand your manuscript over to me. I could be anybody. Mm -hmm. And I know that lots of writers have been stung because there are some unscrupulous people out there. Well, yeah, with my first editor, it did not work out. I mean, I yeah. paid money and I got a, I got what I would call a soft edit. Mm. And so, it, so like to build up trust to somebody I've never met, you know, mm. everything like that. I mean, you were able to create that for me. I was able to offer, you know, my manuscript. So yeah, this is I also that... why I tell people too, as far as like when they go out to interview an editor. Now I'm a little more particular about it because I had an experience where it didn't work mm. out the first time. And that's okay. And I still really care about this editor. I think this editor has really great intentions. So I'm not knocking this editor. We just weren't a good fit for each other. And yeah. I really didn't understand it because in my mind, I'm like, oh, you've edited all these other books that have become bestsellers, you know, but our styles did not agree with each other. So, um, so I, I think like that's why, 
Sorry, I interrupted. I do apologize. No, you're fine. Like, that's one of the reasons I tell us. So this particular editor did not specialize in romance or fantasy. And mm. so I, I just kind of assumed, like, they said that this is something they did in the past. So, and that they used to work for a publishing house, that this was one of their past behaviors that they used to do, you know, this is what they're focusing on now. And I just, in my mind, I thought, well, okay, you can do it. Like, you know, like this is your past, but I am so, I was so grateful to find you who specializes in romance and fantasy. And it also made me really guarded too, as far as like my friends who wanted to come in and like tweak my book. I was like, no, no, no. I totally understand now you're going to edit it. Like it's science, like it's a science document or a business agreement. And there's a different way of editing literature. And I understand that so clearly now. Well, this is good. Yeah. But but getting the right fit is really important. And it's why I wouldn't work with an author if I hadn't done a sample first. So, you know, we went through the thousand words, didn't we, as a sample mm -hmm. before any before any money changed hands, before anybody signed anything or any anything like that. The sample is so important because the author needs to see what I do. <laughs> and if they are happy with it, great. And if they are not, that's all, also fine. So I, I describe it as the Goldilocks principle because, right. you know, it's some levels of intervention for some authors. They might find them too, too much, too heavy for others. They might think, well, I had expected you to do more. You know, it's too light. But then mm -hmm. sometimes you get that author and it. it it is just right, you know, the, the Goldilocks principle. It's, it's just right. You've aligned what they what what the author's asking for and what I'm offering are the same thing. <laughs> so yeah, I really it's nice like when your, it works. I like your metaphor that you're using. And I guess the other thing too, just so um people understand like our relationship. So when I first reached out to Claire, um, it was really unclear to me. I had paid with my first editor for a line edit it. That's what I thought I needed. But Claire and I kind of went back and forth on emails. And then it was like, well, maybe I just need proofreading. So uh, when Claire did her um, like thousand word sample on me, she just did it based off of proofreading, but because we went back and forth, she gave me two examples of what it would look like to have a line edit. So I only had these two examples to go off of, but I was like, no, I definitely want That's line excellent. edit. And mm. I'm really glad I chose that. But I just wanted to kind of give reassurance to anybody out there that was like me and they're not entirely sure what they wanted. I mean, in, in some ways, I wish I would have just asked for the line edit, but it was perfect how it happened because then I could see the difference between here's what proofreading looks like, here's what line edit looks like, and it wasn't making you do double the work or anything. So it worked out just beautifully for me. Yeah. Um, and the problem, one of the difficulties is that not every editor calls the service the same thing. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, you know, I've started using the term line editing um, only really in the last 12 months or so. And that's because in the UK and with the training institution that I went through, you can't actually train in line editing in the institution that I went through. Okay. I trained in line editing, but it was called copy editing. Okay. So the, it was the definitions. It, so they had proofreading training, which I did. Then they had copy editing training, which I did. And then they had developmental editing training. And so they, and whereas line editing sits somewhere between copy and developmental but it was it was covered within the copy editing so you've got UK and American differences and then you've got editor to editor differences because mm -hmm. strictly speak, speaking actually a proofread an actual strict proofread is one that's done on a pdf document it's not okay. done on a word document okay. because um when you're in a Word document, if you are in the Word document and you are changing things in line, you are editing. So yeah. a proof, technically a proofread, is of a page proof when the page has already been typeset and it's sent across and the proofreader doesn't go in and change anything. They mark it up in the 
margins, you know. So it's so fluid. And because it is so fluid, um, it's really important that authors know what it is that an editor is offering and the editors are really clear with, well, these are the, because there's no laws, there's no rules about saying what is in each category. Yeah. Um, but it's it's important to be really clear about what the parameters are of your service, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and I will also tell you for anybody who's considering using Claire, one of the things that was super awesome, I don't know how many other people do this, but I, I interviewed probably 20 maybe 25 editors between my two, two go arounds. So anyway, Claire was the <clears throat> only editor, but I don't know how common this is, but in my experience, she was the only editor who sent me like a, a video of when she did that sample document. She's not only sent over exactly what it would look like as a sample for how I would get the manuscript back, but she also sent like a video over explaining things and making it really clear and pointing things out and almost like a little, little educational, like you went into your teacher, uh, your mode and but it I did. created, it, it helped create and foster that trust and that understanding of this is exactly what I'm getting. It's very clear. And I really People like my videos. That. Yes, I've, I, I don't think it is very common. I don't think it's common at all. But the way that I see it, when I'm attaching various documents to an email to send back, again, it might vary from editor to editor, you yeah. know, the, the way that they send it or how they've done it. And I think I could explain this in writing. I'm perfectly happy to explain it in writing. But I actually would quite like to share my screen, you know, kind of hover over bits um highlight them and say, this is what this is. This is what this means. You should do this in this order. So I do, I, I, the usually like a, a 10 minute video um, that I send back yes. with a sample. It was about yes, 10 minutes, I did 10. one the other day. Yeah, um, so I'd say I do a 10 minute video, which I send back with the sample, just to say, watch this first and then all of the documents, hopefully they'll make sense to you. So yeah. I'd, I started doing that. I'm I'm unaware of anybody. I'm sure some editors must, but yeah. I don't know of any other editors that do the little videos. It was Maybe nice. it's just me. Maybe it's me. <laughs> I, I love the selling point. I'm just going to tell you I love it. So um, yeah. And then I guess the other thing too. So when, when we were working together, um, so it was every, every so like I said, I interviewed all these people. So there were some people that said this was going to take eight weeks. This is going to take 12 weeks, or they might've said, you know, I don't have availability to, he to then, you know, like you might have to wait six months before I can even touch this. And like, I, I think I lucked out on timing with you because you, you just did. happened, <laughs> yeah, you just <laughs> happened to out. have a spot available. And I was so glad because the first editor had my book for more than four months. So, mm. um, and that was four months of not getting anything back to even like work on or, you know, anything. So um, I lucked out, but you only, you only took six weeks and my manuscript was huge. And, and for the people that don't know this, you know, I, I basically had like, uh, I'm going to round up a little, but it was like 155,000 word document. And when I was going through my interview process, there's so many people who wouldn't even quote me because my book was too big and they would told me to go back and cut my book into two or just go in and delete as much as possible and I was like I can't do this this book is complete you don't understand and Claire comes in and was like six weeks I got this and I was like oh my gosh you were one I of know. the, the, the least, like and then I, like it blows my mind because I didn't understand that you were working on other manuscripts while you were working on mine I kind of thought I was like solo but you managed to throw some other things in there and my thing was huge and you only took six weeks and you so stuck with it I was so impressed I was so it impressed was quite, people. it was quite intense and it was not and it wasn't deliberate actually to have other projects at the same time luckily the other projects were novellas so they were really short. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I blocked a Monday and a Tuesday one week where I worked on the novellas and then I went back to yours for, for a week. So it wasn't actually deliberate because, as I said, I used to 
work in a school and I was still working in this school up until July last year okay. um, and be, when I was when I was teaching two days a week and editing the others you know teaching it takes so much time preparation mm-hmm. marking all of it it really even though I was only in the classroom two days a week it was more like three and a bit you know once you've done all of the other stuff that goes around with it so I wasn't having as much time to market myself to market my services so when you came along um it was still really early days of being full-time and I and I I had this gap you see um and at at, at this six week gap or so um I had I had booked in the the short novellas that I've just told you about and I thought well those novellas aren't going to take me six weeks and then you came along and I did I had to think, oh, can I handle this? Um, Oh, now if I was going around again and Ashley had come first, then I would have declined the novellas. But I can't give backward on that. You know, I can't I can't do it. So I don't know if you can see I'm in my attic office. I mean, I'm in the the roof of the house. We have this sloping ceiling here. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, Yeah. So I use it as a pin board and I've got one at the moment for the author I'm working with at the moment. And so I have eight all of the days of the month all of, every day of that six week period I had Ashley chapters <laughs> such and such to such and such however many words tick 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 and I just and I do have stamina you know from working in teaching for so long and I used to be full time with it and I definitely have stamina um and I did it and I did it well and you did yeah. <laughs> She totally made my book an easy read, which was my heart's desire. And I'm so, I'm so pleased with it. And so I'm just going to tell the audience now, like I knew I I had to have her. It was like my mom saying I had to have it. Like, and I never say this, but I was like, I have to have her for the second thing. So even though I don't have my exact word count, I was like, I know like to me, you were this like rising star. And I was like, (laughs) I have to make sure that she can do my book because She's going to be so booked out. I know I this in my heart. And I was like, I, I am claiming a spot now. Like, I, like it's competition. Yeah. I'm like, nobody's taking this from me. No, I, you have got it, Ashley. You've I got, what, what is it, end of June? End it of June. Yes, end of June till it's kind of summer. I'm basically going to be working on your book for the early summer. I love so, it. I'm so yeah. excited. And yeah, and now I do have time to. <laughs> I was just, now I do have time to market my business. I I I'm getting the book in, so so I'm I'm so glad you've been able to snap up the slot for the next edit. Oh, I see, and that's like we talked about this before we started recording, and I was like telling her about how on Facebook the algorithms doesn't always pull up her feed for me, and so the one thing that I did see on there. The, that's God universe source. So thank you. Because the one Facebook post I did see was I've got like, whatever, six contracts. I only have one spot left in March. I had like, two, and I was like, Oh no, no, we're not going down this road. We're taking a spot. Like I will figure this out. Like that was like my thought process. Like, Well, do you know what my, um, one of my tasks to do this month, and I'm going to do it before February the 1st, is to launch a mailing list. And I think that I want to get people like you on my mailing list, Ashley, because when I'm putting out these social media posts about I'm booked up to this point or I have this spot available, the algorithm is not always showing it to the people I want to and yeah. want to see it. So if, you, if, if I can get people who want to know these things on my mailing list, then periodically I can kind of update what my schedule looks like if and if it's helpful to anyone then they can yeah. see it you know and it I won't be missed been, I would have been really sad if I got to the end of book two and I tried to book you out and you're like oh that's gonna be a year and a half because in my first <laughs> round of edits like in my first round of edits there was there was people that were recommended to me and I would interview them and they'd be like well I have six manuscripts ahead of you it's, it's going to be nine months at the earliest or you know, whatever. And I was like, I'm not willing to wait that long. So there are people that I really didn't even get very far in the interview process because our timelines didn't match up. So that's yeah. another thing for anybody who's ever writing a book and they want to consider this. Now, you know, 
So yes, you said you said that about when is it the right time to approach an editor, and it's just really, isn't it? It's as soon as you know as an author that you are serious, that you are serious, you are going to follow this through, that you are going to finish your book, and um, I I hope now you are further on than a lot of my authors, but um, I think for quite a lot of my authors, just having a booking made forces them really in a good way to actually finish because they do have a deadline and they have got something to work towards. So even if your book isn't finished, I think it's a good idea to contact an editor and work towards a date, you know, because if you are going to have to join a queue of nine months, then you've got nine months to write it, you know, so... Yeah, it, it would have been different. Stage it. I will say, um, my first experience, I wrote the book completely and then found an editor. So this second time around, I've obviously I had to have you. So I've booked. <laughs> and I have. I, I can't remember my word count, but I know I have ninety nine pages in <laughs> a regular word document. So, and now I've had to go back and like re-edit because I really head hopped, like really bad the <laughs> second book. So I've had to go, like, that's what I'm actually spending all this time with is like, okay, we're going to stick to one character for at least a scene. So mm. anyway, um, I've gone back and, and done that, but I will tell you the first book, I didn't have this pressure and it was just so easy, right? Like, I'm like, I could take as long as I want. And now I'm like, I'm thinking about this editing and I'm like, screw editing. She's just going to fix everything. Let's just get to writing because I know well, I have deadlines. So I feel yeah. that pressure. Yeah. Well, oh, I hope that's not a bad pressure to feel. I suppose it it might, it depends on the author, doesn't it? Some people yeah. need a deadline. Some people, it really helps motivate them. It helps give them that energy that they, so it depends on the, it very much depends on the author. If you want to write at your own pace and then look for an editor afterwards, if that's a, if that's a more comfortable way of doing it, you know, whatever works, whatever works. Yeah. It is also about knowing yourself. My, my problem is actually editing because editing takes me triple the amount of time that writing takes because it's not my natural skill set. So I could spend the next two months on editing my 99 pages, whereas I could yeah. write a hundred pages in like, um, you know, like a month, you know? So, um, um, well, yeah, there is this idea. Uh, can I say a little small swear word? There's a little, oh, little... Yes. say as many as you want. Okay. okay. So there's this idea, isn't there of the shitty first draft oh, and yeah. yeah, just get it written. You see, I think that, you know, Authors have a different skill. I'm not an author. I was asked, I did a Facebook takeover yesterday morning on a on a writing group. And I was asked by an author whether I ever, ever get any pushback um, from authors after I've done my edits and whether they ever say to me, well, you're not a writer, so why should I listen to you? And I think, absolutely, I am not an author. and But that shouldn't be a problem because it is about what the different skills are. I'm not the ideas person. You're the ideas person. I can't do what you can do. So I don't want you to get, you know, lost within your edits. I want you to finish your story because that's what you're good at. You're good at the characters. You're good at the story. You're good at the structure. You're good at the world building. You're good at all of those things. I'm not a world builder, <laughs> you know, so you don't have to be good at everything. That's it's yeah. it's a team game isn't it if you it really is yeah it is and so. I, I was really happy with what you did so um let, like just just to kind of touch base so why did you choose like this like how does it like what is your experience how does it make you feel like editing this like you know because like for me like when I'm writing it's liberating yeah it's really nice to help writers um who want to be helped I suppose um and if I make the comparison to teaching high school English <laughs> I love kids I love teenagers I mean I spent 18 years working with teenagers if I didn't like teenagers I would not have worked with them for 18 years but when you give a teenager their work back and it's marking you know have marked their paper this is feedback that they actually haven't asked to have. They just, it's forced feedback. 
you know they just have to have it and then part of the learning process is and now you need to improve on this and now you need to move on and that's all well and good and you have to go through that as a child you know you go through school you get used to being judged so I suppose what I really like about what I'm doing now is that it is it is people who want feedback not people who have feedback forced upon them yeah yeah so I really and that was and that was a really nice move to make for me because I'm you know actually I was about to say then I'm using similar skills I mean I am because I've always worked with student stories and I've you know I've always worked with creative writing and and so on and so forth and um, but it is very different it is very different when you're kind of doing it on this far grander scale and you know you've got these publishing ambitions and and so on and um, but it is really nice to I've always on my first day of teacher training we were sitting in a seminar and the uh, professor um, sort of went around, went around the seminar and asked us all to explain why we were there. And there was really two responses that people gave. They were either there for the kids or they were there for the love of the subject. Okay. okay? So for me, I mean, it was very much, you know, both. But if I if I had to, if you put a gun to my head and had to say, why did you teach for 18 years? Why did you teach English for 18 years? I love books. <laughs> I love books. I love reading. I love writing. I absolutely live and breathe books, you know? Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. And I'm st- so I'm still doing that. So, yes, I've, I've come out of education but I'm still absolutely and to be honest I'm more involved you know obviously I'm more involved in books now so it's it's perfect for me it's it's really the thing that I absolutely loved about um, about education was because I was so passionate about my subject you know and so and I'm still taking that forward so books 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 and more books yeah, and you love reading, and now you're getting to I work do. with all of these authors, and you've specifically s- selected your genre of fantasy romance, and so, like, like, what's that like, having all of these stories that are, like, never hit the market, you're getting the first, like, side of it. it um, I have to say, it was very difficult deciding how to niche. Okay. Um, I knew I wanted to niche, um, sorry, you know, I, pronunciation isn't it niche anyway it's okay yeah there we go like English it. UK pronunciation um but I knew I wanted to focus in on a couple of genres but it was so difficult choosing because I read a lot of historical fiction okay. I read literary fiction I read crime um but I do read a lot of fantasy I do le- do read a lot of romance and there's something about those authors you know, again, it's it comes it it comes back to mindset. So there's a reason why I like working with indie authors as opposed to traditionally published, and then there's a reason why I like working with fantasy writers, and I like working with romance writers. You just get a sense of people so and that, community. Yeah. Okay. So it's about community because I was going to ask you because then it made me think. Well, is there a difference between like, I I don't want to say quality because that's not the right word, but is there a difference between the stories that come to you as like traditional versus indie? But you're really saying that it's about the connection, you know, that personal investment that an indie author has in their book that creates that dynamic. Because I don't, I don't work with traditional publishing houses, um, but if I worked with traditional publishing houses, um, it it would be through. It depends on the publishing house, but there would be a desk editor, and the desk editor would would be the go between between me as a freelance editor working for the traditional publishing house and the author. So you don't, you know, there'd be no kind of back and forth emails necessarily between me and the author there's there's kind of lots of staging posts in traditional publishing which I don't want Mm -hmm. I'd rather speak to the person I'm working for the benefit of rather than via a chain of command I suppose yeah yeah I it is more personal yeah so yeah um, yeah, so that that really appeals to me 
Um, and I like the integrity and authenticity of the indie world. Yeah. If you want to write a story, like when you were saying then about 155,000 words, that's okay. If that's what the story needs to be to tell the story, I was trying to think then, you know, what would you cut out? It would yeah. be lost, wouldn't it? But they didn't read my book to know that. Well, exactly. Because yeah. I didn't find that six weeks that I worked on, that six weeks that I worked on your manuscript, it wasn't difficult. It actually wasn't. It wasn't okay. difficult because, and it wasn't tiring. It was intense, but that's different to being tiring. Um, because the story drove me forward. Yeah. Sometimes people ask me whether I can concentrate on the story at the same time as you know, doing the line edits, looking at the punctuation, all, all of that kind of stuff. Yes, I can. And, and it especially helps if the story is strong. How can I not see the story? I'm not just, you know, I'm not a machine scanning, well, you know, so line by line. And when he was reading, like, this is just one, you know, thought or whatever. But when my husband was reading my book, he like, he was so frustrated and angry he doesn't like editing. So let's just put that out there. But for him, like he, he, I wanted him just to read the story to have some type of external validation because I hadn't sent it to anybody. So he read chapter one and that's all he got. And he couldn't even get through chapter one because he was so frustrated with the edits that needed to be made. So he couldn't even immerse himself into the story because he was like, you know, like, so yeah. not that he couldn't understand the story, but the edits were blocking his enjoyment of it. And you're yeah. able to like ride both of those really easily. Yeah, I am. And, it, That's and okay I'm not sure why. There's something <laughs> obviously just the makeup of my brain. It makes it, it works. Yeah. I'll tell you what I do actually, which really helps is um, in, my, in terms of my processes, um, I use the read aloud function. Oh, okay. Yeah on Microsoft Word so and I use that after I have kind of done a scan 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 this type of you know checking so that I make sure I hear the story as well um yeah I think that really helps I think that really helps the because I listen to a lot of audiobooks as well so I, I think do. that that really yeah I can yeah. I can follow the story as well as doing all of the yeah, you know, I've actually heard other people, other authors suggest that to do that for your own book. So, I mean, yeah. it makes sense. And I know like when I, so I'm also a hypnotist. And so when I, um, when I do my editing of my um, hypnosis tracks, I will just put it in the background, not intentionally listening to it, but maybe I repeated a word and didn't cut it out. And yeah. it, it immediately flags. I could be in the it middle of working on something and like all of a sudden my brain is triggered like that's not right. There's something wrong. And you have to go back and be like, mm. what was wrong? So it's really interesting how that works. The yeah, it's really powerful, brain. actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if if people don't have the budget to mm. hire an editor, because I know also that people do in the indie way, they have to find the budget. Um, and if and uh, I, obviously I'm going to say, find yourself an editor save up and make sure you do have an editor a proofreader or whatever but if you absolutely can't then a, the read aloud function is your best friend it really is you've got yeah. to use it I know it's that I did a really post powerful. this is just like my personal opinion but to me like it's it's a payback system so did did it hurt to come up with money to pay for editing yes but to me in my mindset it's like, but my, my book is going to um, get more referrals and recommendations and it's going to do better. Yeah. If it's a, it's a, if it's a good, clean read, yeah. then if I didn't get the editing for it, I just threw it out there. It probably would, it would probably do okay, but it could do like so much better. I just feel like my money is going to be returned to me through having it professionally edited. Oh. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, I would say I would say that it's I've got to say that in terms of my my it's job, but, but you know, so it's going to sound incredibly biased, but it is true. Um, I read a book um on my Kindle a couple of months ago, 
which hadn't been well edited and I wanted to love it it had everything going for it that was my kind of story um and I just found myself popping my Kindle down just quite regularly. I was reading a bit and then I just pop it down. And because usually I'll just read for, you know, I'm not noticing the time going by. I'm just immersed mm. and I'm in the story. And I would read a bit and I'd pop it down. I read yeah. a bit and I pop it down again. I think, what is my problem with this story? Because it's got everything, it's got all of the ingredients. Yeah. That make it my kind of book. But there's something, you know, there's something. And, um, sometimes you know it's hard to turn the editor eye off yeah it's it's oh, sure. it, to read for pleasure um and I do have like a tolerance zone of I know that even traditionally published books there's always going to be something missed we're not mm -hmm. perfect um but there were just a few too many and you don't want a few too many problems they're just going to make your reader go oh, oh I can't yeah. be bothered with this anymore you yeah. know yeah. So yeah, it, it, it is an investment. If depending on what you want from your writing, because some people just getting to the end of the story, getting their story out into the world, having their friends and family read it, having a few key people know that this book exists in the world, that's fine. But there are also people um who want to pay the mortgage. Yeah, my husband is that person. So he is an indie author, and um, we're you know through a combination of his earnings from selling his books on Amazon and a combination of my editing earnings. Well, we're paying our bills. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Working. I, yeah, I was going to ask you: Do you edit his books? I do. I do. Okay. My husband, my husband is uh, registered blind. He has 5% um, vision in one eye and okay. has no vision at all in the other. And he used to use an editor that wasn't me. <laughs> he used to, or he tried to, he tried going down that path. And, you know, with track changes and so on, and, and what you get back from an editor, that was too difficult to to work with his eye condition, to work with his software on his computer when he was using the kind of, um, oh, sorry, the word's gone out of my head, but the read aloud functions and the, you know, the access, that's the word, accessibility settings. Accessibility settings and track changes do not work well together. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it is one other reason why I got into editing in the first place was because I wanted to be able to edit my husband's books without him losing out in any way. So I wanted him to be able to have a professional edit. So I've always been good at grammar. I've always been, you know, the English teacher. I've always done that. But people really look down their noses at authors who have their mum, their, their former English teacher, you know, mm, yeah, edit yeah. their book. And I didn't want John to go out into the world saying, my wife edited your, my book, <laughs> you know, that to be the reaction, did she, you know, that that wasn't good enough. So I trained, I got all of the professional qualifications to make oh, sure wow. that I could That's do cool. his books properly, because yeah. there is a difference, there is a big difference between marking a student's work as a high school English teacher and what you need to do to have a book uh, polished, ready for uh, publishing, for publication. So, so yeah, I've kind of gone off on a tangent there, but um, but yeah, he's an, he's an indie author. And one of the reasons why I got into editing in the first place uh, was, was to help him out. Um, so I do edit his, his books. Um, he uses that desk over there. He also has a desk over here. We have this this room, this office, and we do it quite quickly because I don't need to do any of the track changes. He's just over my shoulder, so I just say, "John, what did you mean here?" You know, That's awesome. la 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 la. Um, so I can get through his quite quickly because just he's here and we do it together. So, I and I'm so it. used to his style. Well, I was going to say something like I didn't know because there's some couples that they, they can't work together. And it's not that their relationship yeah. is any less or anything like that. It's just people are really different. Like my husband and I, when you look at our relationship, we are much better at divide and conquer. So we're not the type of couple that can do the same task 
Yeah. Side by side. He's got his things. I got mine. And that's because we're both very independent people. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, like, and we both think our way is the right way, you know? And so dividing um, task and conquering works really well for us, but side by side. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're 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 sickening, me and John. We really are. We um John and I, sorry, it's speaking in this really colloquial way this afternoon. But um yeah, we we've been to, we're 40, we're both 40, and we've been together since we were 19. And um even at the age of 19, that summer, the summer we first got together, we um worked together as well. <laughs> and like we've worked together a couple of times throughout our lives. We we used to work with um children at what I don't know what they'd call it in America but we call it a play scheme it's like a summer holiday kind of like a camp but it's not residential so we both worked with children together at at that camp and then a few then several years later we worked together again and he was a mentor um at, at the same school where I was teaching so we've sort of circled around and now we're back together again working together for the third time so we like working together (laughs) cool and I'm glad that you do like this is just my brain like even though I might have to work really hard to market myself I'm sitting here and being like you need to market this like this is a whole audience of authors out there that probably could use your skill set with the like the the training you already have with working with your husband with limited eyesight you could yeah be a niche right there well exactly no to do. yeah, yeah. I ha- and I have actually so I have worked with other visually impaired authors because John dictates a lot of his uh novel uh mm-hmm. novels manuscripts and so he uses a software called Dragon which transcribes what he's saying and it throws up I mean it's it's good. The level of accuracy is good, but it throws up some interesting errors, which are just because it hasn't quite caught the pronunciation. So there's certain things that you have to look out for in a transcribed manuscript, which will be different to, to what you look out for in a manuscript that's just been typed, you know? So, um, yeah, working with a visually... Yeah, and I've done it a couple of times, and actually there is somebody... W- res- somebody messaged me the other day and said do you work with the visually impaired and I said yeah sometimes I do yeah okay well I've got this author blah 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 so there's a potential other I don't know so yeah I do work with visually impaired people too so you that that's on your website (laughs) now (laughs) that's on your your main page of why you should work with me like you're so talented look at your diversity that you're offering all right. Well, so I want to ask you, what makes it a good story for you? Like you've read tons of stories, like what hooks you, like what, what distinguishes, you know, a story to you? Um, I have to, so character motivation is really important for me. So it's not about necessarily liking a character. I don't really mind if I don't like the character, but I've got to understand why they're acting in the way that they are acting you know like let me pause on that because that was actually one thing I was really confused about in the very beginning because like with my first editor experience my limited experience um I had to have this like two to three hour uh like zoom call like we're doing right now where we went over like my backstory and who my characters are and who my motivation and you didn't need any of that and so like I was like why why isn't she asking me this And, you know, I got to say, though, that that was actually one of the things that's like really validating because at at one point I did check in and I was like, are are you, why are you? Yeah, you had some radio silence for me. Yeah, I was like, why are you asking me questions? And you came back. I just asked that, you know, and you came back with, I truly understand the character's motivations and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm a much better writer than I realized. (laughs) Like, I loved that. For me... If I have to ask lots of questions, then there's something wrong with the story because I've got to, while I'm doing the edit, I've got to be in the position of your ideal reader and your ideal reader can't fire off an email to you to say, why is Sabina, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, what's, so you've got, you've 
got to use your critical reading skills. You've got to think, well, what do I understand here from the information that I've been given? You know, and if the information is fairly limited, then that's OK, because you can kind of. You know, part of you don't want to spoon feed the reader all of the details. There's got to be some gaps where you sort of kind of fill in the motivations yourself. You sort of fill in fill in the details yourself. But there's got to be enough where it starts the train of of kind of cause and effect going on. Well, she's probably saying this because of this, yeah. or actually, her behaviour in this other scene um, explains to me why. She was like this in this previous scene, you know, it's a it's a jigsaw. And I don't tend to ask my authors too many questions okay. because um, you like the puzzle. Be, you like solving the puzzle. I like solving the puzzle. And I think, well, your readers can't. And you asked me before this, um, before this interview, um, I think you mentioned about developmental edits, didn't oh, you? And how yes, I how would I how would I know? Or oh, what did you? I can't remember. Do you want to ask me about what was it you were saying about well, developmental edits? Well, it I was... wanted to know if when you were reading somebody's sample, or is it, yeah. is, you know, is there any point, whether it's the sample or in the story, that you go back to an editor and you say, you know what, like I, I can continue editing this, but you really need to consider developmental editing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was that was it. That's what you were saying. That's tricky because from a thousand words, it is very difficult to, to tell that. Yeah. But I do, I do have a clause in my contract which says that I can kind of press the press on the brakes. We can kind of pause. You know, if I get, let's say, depends on the length of the book, but let's say a third of the way into it, and I'm thinking this really isn't working that we can stop and we can rethink um so you know and I, I did have that before with with an author where their timeline was not working and okay. there was you know and it, and it just hadn't been plotted out quite right um and so we kind of discussed terms I thought of some solutions and I was actually able to help him and together um we fixed the timeline issues so yeah I just put on the brakes and and if if I can't fix it or we can't fix it together then I would say look I'm not the right person for this you need to go and seek a specialist developmental editor to help you out so it, it is really difficult to tell from a thousand words whether developmentally mm -hmm. there's going to be an issue or not um but also um, and I was talking to my husband about this the other day. We were talking about Goodreads. And do you oh, yeah. use Goodreads? Yes, I do. Um, so we were talking track. about, pardon? It helps me track all the books I've read. Definitely. So we were talking about the star rating system and how, you know, you might read, let's say something like you read something from the literary canon. You read some Charles Dickens or you read... Pride and Prejudice, or you read something, you know, you read, yeah, um, and then you and then you read something that you've picked up at the airport to read on the beach when you're on holiday, and it's and the book that you've read in the airport in the airport or on the beach, you absolutely loved it, and you really want to give it five stars, but you also gave Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice five stars, and then you say to yourself. Am I really saying that this book that I've just picked up for the beach is as good as Pride and Prejudice? And I think you can say, yes, it is, because it's the promise of the premise. So this is how okay. um, uh, John and I, uh, you know, rate and review books. How well do they stack up against what's been sold to you? Really? So I think that when I'm when I am editing, I think Am I being entertained? Because I, you could work on a manuscript. This is what some people do. Some people work on a manuscript for years, you know, yeah. absolutely years. Ten years later, they're still not confident enough to publish it. They've just been tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. But when is enough enough? Yeah, exactly. I think just about everything could, could have another developmental edit. You could say, oh, should we take out that point of view? Oh, should we get rid of that chapter? Should we move chapter five to chapter you know yeah I think just about every book could have another developmental edit and it's so subjective mm -hmm. so 
I don't as long as as long as this book is delivering what it set out it sets out to deliver you know for the age group for the who you know your intended reader whether you're thinking which gender is going to be you know that kind of thing, those kind of demographic considerations is it hitting the genre conventions is it is it selling you what it promised to sell you so i i wouldn't stop somebody and suggest a developmental edit if it was doing what it promised it would do okay well is what i would say interesting because again when i this is more on my first round of um interviewing editors but i had several editors not only with my word count but several editors asked me point blank did you have a developmental editor and if i said no that was like click they're done with this conversation And so I chose not to go through a developmental editor. I just trusted my ability and I went with it, you know? And so, um, but like, I do know that there are a lot of reasons to have a developmental editor. And do you find like for most of the people that have come to you, do they already have it done or like, no? No. Um, Again, going back to my husband, you see, I think one reason why I work so well with indies is because I've seen the indie, I've seen the indie process through from idea to, you know, finished book and sales and and so on and success um, with with John. And so I know about all the different kind of processes. Now, John had a developmental edit of his first novel which by the way has never seen the light of day <laughs> but he he sent that for a developmental edit and that's the only developmental edit that he has ever had okay but it was still really valuable because he learned such a lot about crafting and structure from the feed i mean it made him just lose confidence in the in the story full stop that's why that it didn't go any further but it it he learned so much from the sort of scathing (laughs) feedback this was quite a number of years ago feedback that he received that Mm -hmm. he then you know because he is resilient and he's happy to receive feedback he then took a little bit like what you're saying about head hopping he then took that forward to make his next book better Mm -hmm. so I think there is a case for I mean if you had the budget why wouldn't you if you have the budget to be able to afford the developmental edit Go for it. See, do it. I didn't want to do it because I was I was concerned that they may alter my story. Well, there is that too. Yeah. And I didn't want them to alter my story. So I didn't, I mean, well, that's my personal choice and preference, but that doesn't mean there isn't value to them. So yeah. Um, yeah. I heard you say, but I heard you say in the podcast with your sister, you've been writing for a long time. It's not you're not new to writing you said you you have gone back to writing at various kind of key points in your life so Mm -hmm. you've been writing a long time and so I think that just I think every author's um subsequent work gets better as a result of their previous work yeah so you're learning a lot of those lessons yeah um you know you're intuitive you you can feel what works and I, I mean all writers really have got to be readers. <laughs> I yeah. think a red flag for me would be an author who, you know, struggles to answer the question, what are you reading at the moment? What did you read? You know, what's your favourite book? <laughs> um, <laughs> but we pick up so much from stories. We've, we've. Oh my gosh, yes. Don't we? So, so yeah, I mean, it depends on the author. And so if you have the budget and if you are, up for feedback on the big things and are up to you know and are happy to rewrite (laughs) because sometimes it's like it will totally be this would work better as first person but I've written as third person yes I know but you're going to have to rewrite it as first or like some quite major changes like let's change the tense for instance you've written in the present tense this would only work in the past tense so it can be quite major. The birth challenge, I actually started off as first person. 
Did you? I, I think at like chapter three, I was like, no, this has to be third. And I had to go back and like rewrite everything. So yeah. I but you obviously that. felt that, you know, you obviously could tell that it was holding you back in some way. So yeah. 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 As soon as I introduced plan, then I was like, well, we got to <laughs> switch this up. <laughs> so, um, but okay. So for you, it, you like a very character driven story with those motives. Is there anything else that makes it a great story for you? Um, the arc really, I want to see, okay. yeah, I want to see some pressure put on a character. I want to see how they cope with that pressure. I want to see, I want to be able to compare and contrast the person. Again, I'm still talking about character, clearly. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I want to uh, compare and contrast that character um, by the end of the story compared to where they were at the start. And also the world, yeah. The, the, you know, the wider world as well. Have have we Has the wider world, the culture, sort of adjusted in line with what we subsequently know now? You know, where where are we leaving off and I don't like the ends to be too neatly tied so I also don't like being tricked can I tell you about a book that I read recently yeah. where I was tricked and I was oh, like the bait and switch it was so um I won't name the author she's quite a big author I was really really surprised I was absolutely really really surprised um so I'd read about a third into the book. It was pretty chunky. I'd read, I read about a third. And then it was the classic. It just suddenly switched and the character woke up from a coma. Okay. And the first third of the book was all coma dream. Don't do that to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I was quite into that world and that world was suddenly taken away from me, yeah. never to return <laughs> because it was revealed it was a coma dream oh yeah that's classic you know yeah and then I woke up yeah, yeah. I was really surprised this really established author did this anyway that's yeah, something so I don't like don't trick me <laughs> I'd like I'm gonna circle back to you because I I want to make you shine but like if somebody's wanting to work with you like what is your like ideal client absolutely we know it's an indie um yeah we know it's fantasy do you have like your your avatar I don't know how much into marketing you're into so your avatar client my avatar I think has evolved really over time um I I, I do seem to be fairly decent um at marketing I, I do a fairly good job at marketing um I don't have an avatar in mind particularly of an, of an author and I think where I was going wrong initially was thinking about well who are the kinds of people who seem naturally drawn to me um, and that was but because I'm quite a people person it, I was sometimes drawing people that were the wrong people as well mm -hmm. so you know I, I sort of have had to develop it to think, uh, you know, more specifically about the right kind of author for me. But I like to work with ambitious authors um, and I don't want to work with the hobbyists, really. Um, yeah. I want you to have grander plans for yourself and I want you to um, want to share your story and not get cold feet I know that some people have an edit and then the book still doesn't see the light of day because they're too frightened to press publish. Yeah. So, and I understand, I do understand that, but if I could work with the more confident end of authors, then that is who I would rather work with, um, who have, who are reflective and resilient and want to see where this journey can take them to make sure that, you know, the ones who know that they're going to learn a lot from book one and then we'll get better at book two and and so on. And who are actually willing to be flexible. So I, I've seen a couple of people ask the same question on some author groups, which is they wrote book one and then they wrote book two and then they wrote book three. By the time they got to book three, they feel like their book one is terrible, <laughs> you know, because they've learned such a lot since book one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is particularly difficult when you've written a series because mm -hmm. you think well I want to get the read through 
And if you think your reader is not going to be satisfied with book one, well, they're not going to read on to two and three. Even if three is wonderful, then that book number three is not going to get any readers if book number one, you know. So I think as as you go forward with your um, writing journey, I think that it's important to to be able to look at bigger picture and strategy. So I've suggested to authors before, you know, if there's something about book one that you don't like anymore, can you pull back? Can you readjust this story? Could it start at book two? You know, could book two be book one? Is there something you can do there where that shifts forward one? Could could you could there be bits of book one which you now use as like a prequel novella? Yeah. So that um that kind of um flexibility and willingness to I also think it's important and I don't know what you're doing so I hope I'm not going not going to put my foot in it here Ashley I think it's important to um not to bite off more than I want ambition but I also want people who don't try to bite off more than they can chew so um it's not ideal to commit yourself to for instance a nine book series if you're brand new because as you say, by book five, six, you'll hate book one by this point mm. and you'll be, re you know. So I think yeah. sort of trilogies are nice because after a trilogy, you can move on to something else. But kind yeah. of, I don't, don't want to be... Me, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, well, well, obviously, we'll I'm working See where it goes. Two. See where it goes. Well, and I already know book two is going to have book three because of where book two is ending. So, um, but I don't know what's, I don't even know what books, I don't even know what happens in book three. I know where yeah. book two ends, but it's, it's a mystery to me and I can't wait to find out. <laughs> but I would honestly, I would, I would so, I'm just sowing the seeds now for you that maybe three would be nice to get to, to a nice point to get to, because even for yourself, you might want a fresh start afterwards. You might want to write something else and you might just be ready to shake things up a little bit and and try a different story by this point so I don't think that new writers should should commit themselves to kind of nine ten etc uh, book series I think that gets a bit much well I always intended this to be just one book <laughs> but then when I got as where I got I was like well I'm not able to finish this yeah so to finish it I had to go into book two so mm -hmm. yeah I mean I get that um so like, as far as let's talk about my book for a second, what were some differences in my book than maybe some of the other ones that you've edited? Well, one of my other fantasy authors was um, very upset that um, his word count was that you exceeded his word count. He thought that he was my epic. He said 155,000 words. He'd sent me 135,000 like a few months before. 155. So, so yes, I mean, there's the obviously the scale of it was a little like 20,000 words more than my longest author to date. So, um, yeah, the scale of it was different compared to some of the other fantasy um, authors that I have worked with um I think oh I know I know what what was and I messaged you to say this because I absolutely loved it Thank I didn't you. really know about your sort of tarot you know mindfulness all this kind of aspects of you I didn't really know about that when I started editing yeah. your work and I absolutely loved it because there was one day can't, can't even remember what was wrong with me there was one day where I was just in a bit of a funk don't remember what was there was something on my mind there was something wrong and I was editing a chapter of yours with Fabia yeah, yeah Fabia. Fabia yeah um and she spoke to me whatever she was saying to Sabina that day spoke to me and it was about something like it was about sort of controlling your reactions about you know, what you can control about external forces or you can't or what you're in control of. I think I was hung up on something. Um, and I've been doing a lot, lot, lot of reading in recent years about mindset and about healthy mindset and so on. Um, and I and it was really, really refreshing for me to read, you know, an epic fantasy like yours that felt really current because of the healthy mindset I yeah. liked that I really yeah. liked that and that was different 
for me where I felt like the book was doing more than just telling me the story. Yeah, actually. I, I really wanted to enter, do more than just entertain. Not There's nothing wrong with just entertaining because no. I love, I love yeah. just being entertained. But like when I coach people, there are some very common, consistent things across a lot of the people that come to me. And so I was like, you know what? In the the the, the old days, like hundreds of years ago, people learned through stories yeah and I really wanted to take the story and teach people how to have this mindset in these tough moments so yeah, that they I, could there's some it's there's and I'm also a hypnotist so I understand how your subconscious works and your subconscious works with stories so I wanted to make sure in a story format that their subconscious was seeing an example a modeling of how they could have a coping skill in this situation without it being like in your face you know what I mean yeah. like it's still like you're still being entertained and yeah so that was really refreshing I felt like it was really modern if that doesn't sound condescending but very sort of it it just suited me it suited my zeitgeist of the kind of the way that <laughs> well I didn't I, know that you were into mindset so it seems well like it's so aligned I, yeah well exactly and as I said it's about and that so it is the mindset of the people that I like working with and so the fact that that was there in the story as well and the characters were kind of coaching each other through trials and tribulations um that was really new to me you know obviously characters come up against it but but yeah it is that coaching I, it, there wouldn't be a story without conflict so obviously everything mm. I read there's some sort of conflict or other but it's the fact that there were that characters were kind of coaching each other through it and, and allowing each other the space to struggle with it come struggle up with and people. realize and fix it yourself I mean here's advice here's you know but you've got to work through it yourself so yeah if it, it I think that was it I think it felt like a different tone of fantasy to what I'm used to in a refreshing way yeah and yeah. I mean the characters were young so that was that was cool you know and it sort of worked in that regard um but yeah, yeah, uh, that, that was different. And I know that I met and you talked about this with your sister, but I loved the dialogue and I did not think that there was too much dialogue because it was so natural. It was so natural. Thank you. It just, and you clearly can picture these characters and you can really sort of hear them talking to each other. Yeah, sometimes authors don't do as well with dialogue because it is too wooden. Um, and it wasn't wooden at all, you know. Well, and I so. was judging myself before you let me know that you liked, um, well, it'd be just because like I have read, I read tons of stuff too. And I, so in my mind, there was this comparison that was happening, even though I'm a life coach, even though I know comparison isn't healthy, like it still exists. I just ignore it as much as possible or I face it, you know, like those are my two yeah. options. And so like, I was thinking in my head, well, this has a lot of dialogue, but I enjoy it. So I'm keeping it like, so that was my yeah. choice. And, but in my head, I was like, when I read a lot of books that they don't have nearly as much dialogue. And so I was thinking, well, this, this is a negative towards my book. That's how I was coming up with it. But I was like, I don't care. This is who I am. This is my authentic self. I'm keeping it. Like, yeah. And I thought as well that the uh, dialogue really helped with the characterization because they all had such distinct voices you weren't going mm -hmm. to mix two characters up so if I if you took you know if you took a line of dialogue from a page I could tell who was speaking they yeah, had a very really distinctive cool. yeah and you were saying to your sister as well about kind of keeping the details of the characters a little bit more minimal so that to really get that reader immersion into picture them how you picture them and I think voices tell us so much about somebody yeah yeah so well it's I, I mean that's it it is a balancing act and I can see why the advice to authors is to make sure that you do have this good balance of description and dialogue and I do believe you did I, you know you did you didn't just it wasn't just it wasn't a script you didn't give me a script it was dialogue and it was description as well and the balance was good 
Um, and if you feel like it was a little, it was um, there was more dialogue than you often see in what you read, yeah, possibly there, possibly, but it worked, and that's if it works, it works. Yeah. So, so who was your favorite character? Um. Well, I think that I, th I was going to say Fabia. And I know you love Fabia too, don't you? I heard you say that to your sister. Absolutely. And I've already mentioned the mindset stuff. But I really liked the sort of tensions between Flan and um, Benford Tulk. Oh, yes. So, yeah. yeah, I really liked the sort of the way that they um, butted heads. Loved each other up the, you know, yeah. I, I, I love that kind of competitive. You love <laughs> Ah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that. And this idea that, you know, she had all of these suitors, I think it was just sort of setting up such a fun, lo lots of opportunities for competitiveness, I suppose. Yeah, um, I really so enjoyed, enjoyed that. So mm. like, I just as a side story, and then we'll get back to things. But you know, um, so I, my husband, I didn't let him read anything other than chapter one, but I finally gave him after it's been lovely and polished by you I gave him the whole book to read and so anyway um it, it, for whatever reason he's kind of like my my one of my harsher critics you know and so it's one of the reasons I didn't let him read it because I was like oh I'm so sensitive to what he says because he's important to me you know and so I know this and so I was like you're not reading this but he finally read it and so one of my favorite scenes to write he absolutely hated and it was all this like bantering you know and he was like I don't even know these characters I don't even care about these characters and I was like but I loved that scene <laughs> so anyway just I love a bit story. of banter I love a bit of banter yeah so um as far as like I, I wanted to have teaching moments for editors out there so what do you feel like is the most common <laughs> editing stuff that you see and like maybe tips to solving that um uh, just to consult my notebook because I made a couple of notes earlier okay. about okay. this I love um, it Let's have a little look. What did I say earlier? Oh, yes. Um, so one real, real common error is in punctuating speech and especially punctuating interrupted speech. So, uh, you know, so, uh, for instance, an action happens in the middle of somebody saying something. And that's just a technical difficulty. But when people are, you know, do I use commas here? Do I use M dashes? Like, how do I navigate the the fact that I've broken up what the character is saying by them doing an action so I quite often have to deal with interrupted speech and how and punctuating that um now there are, are you going to do some show notes are you um after the podcast okay, okay. like you mean like in my show notes like how they in, can connect with you and stuff like that yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say now I wish I had this on my own website, but I don't at the moment. There is another editor's website, but you know, who has a really excellent blog on punctuating speech and how to. I think I probably put it in the in the queries or the style comments for yourself um, of how to punctuate interrupted speech. So that's a really useful resource that I can pass on to people. Um, there's also dangling modifiers. They're always fun. Um, so a dangling modifier, I quite often see this. And it's almost like that idea of can you uh, scratch your head and rub your stomach at the same time? There's some things that you can't you can't do simultaneously. So this would be, for instance, at the start of a sentence where you might have something like, um, uh, you know, bending down to pick up his sword, he stabs his opponent in the chest. It's like he can't be both bending down yeah. and also, you know, that kind of construction where like a false simul simultaneity where two things are, are said to be happening at once that can't possibly happen at once so dangling modifiers and false simultaneities which uh, are kind of caused by the same problem which is the subordinate clause at the start of a sentence it's like well you can't have those two things together they don't work together um so i do see problems with that a fair bit um head hopping which i mentioned to you i don't get loads of it 
but I do get bits and pieces where authors do sort of drift out of the narrative point of view that they have adopted and it's all about narrative distance so for instance you know if you're t if, if we are given access to a character's thoughts um then we are even though it's third person we are in the third person limited because we're getting access to their thoughts so this isn't an example from yours but for instance if we then find out that they i don't know came out in spots or something or their face something happened to their face it's like are they looking in a mirror like how does that character that character can't see their own face Mm -hmm. you you're looking at this character now from somebody else's point of view you've head hopped to the person who's looking at them but we were in their thoughts a moment ag ago and you've not shifted you've not shown by a line break or anything that we've shifted point of view um so so things like that and they but they can be quite easily fixed um you know with line spaces so that you can show that change from one third person limited to another or for instance like the example with the face like you can't see what's on on your own face and there, there's not suddenly a mirror you know that's too much of a coincidence but <laughs> they could feel yeah, something you on that their a face of times to me. you know that they if, if it was somebody with a red face they can feel their red face as opposed to seeing their red face you know yeah. so it's kind of like internalizing it rather than somebody viewing it from this way onwards that in, you, you're getting the feeling from the inside so it's narrative distance yeah I do see I do see the occasional drift um, into either head hopping or occasionally the odd bit of omniscience where we're, we're even further zoomed out you know um yeah. like little did this, this character know that in seven years such and such a thing hang on why are we suddenly god <laughs> you know we were really close yeah. we were in we were in this character's head a minute ago and now we're god and we mm -hmm. know what's happening in the other side of the world and so that kind of movement around so narrative distance can be a bit of a so i, I would say that um new writers if you can read up on narrative distance to be sure that you know what what you're doing and and how to achieve it well because that is something that a developmental edit would be helpful for but if you are going to for, forgo the developmental edit for whatever reason you've chosen to forgo it then at least you need to make sure you're aware of narrative distance so that so that that you can give so that you can give your reader the experience you want to give them you know? you know one of the things that you explained to me which I didn't really understand because I just I I mean I I'm a curious person I love being in people's heads I love knowing what they're thinking so th that's one of the reasons I have so many point of views and like the head hopping but you explained to me that that actually is creating the opposite effect of I'm going for it like unimmerses you and I didn't get that and I was like oh I really value and appreciate that like teaching and the pointing things out and kind of guiding me on ways to do it differently. So yeah, I mean, I thought it was just really great how you did it and very, like I said, aware. I'm now more aware, but I did like, I did want to ask because like, so there are so many developmental editors out there that is like, you have to have, you have to have a scene break. And so there's times when like, you know, I'm working on something and I'm like, well, I don't want a scene break and I go with your line break. So like, do, do you feel like there's like a, a rule of thumb with that? Like you have to have five paragraphs or like whatever, like. No, no, I don't. There isn't a rule of thumb, but it is, it's, it would almost make you seasick yeah. if you were shifting too quickly. So, you know, a rule of thumb, I don't know. I think I said to you, because there was sometimes I added in the word, it, you know a phrase like it appeared or it seemed so that we will yes, we'll, we'll, yeah yeah so that we could see from we could stay with the point of view character that we were currently with so we fixed it that way but sometimes you had to have a shift because the story wouldn't work unless you did have a shift and I sort of I remember thinking about yours and thinking well I don't want to shift now because we've literally only had a paragraph of this character's thoughts and I don't want to shift because it's too too much jolting around so I mean, I like, I like it when a chapter is told from a certain 
mm-hmm. POV, you know. Mm-hmm. But I understand that doesn't always work with the storytelling. So the long, the longer the better. The more, you know, the longer you can immerse the reader in in that narrative point of view, the better. But at the very least, you know, three paragraphs or, or so. Otherwise, it's too much, too much jumping around. Yeah. So hmm, that was kind of my else, rule of thumb. Would... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just that's it's a rule of thumb that I you know I don't really want to be drawn on because it's not something it it depends on the context but yeah. I would be picking you up on it if it was shorter than three paragraphs like we've just changed that's too quick <laughs> I know uh, I'll I'll keep working on that for me and for other people are out there but as, you know we we managed though didn't we we, we managed yeah. with book one when you didn't know so much about the old head hopping and we managed and we fixed and we did so um you are more knowledgeable now I'm sure it will be better because as a result of this but don't get hung up on it to the yeah. point where I it can't write <laughs> prevents you yeah moving yeah. forward yeah exactly so keep moving okay. forward yeah I don't want to do too much censorship exactly yeah exactly it's about so finding you, the balance do you find a lot of the people that you worked with I mean because like I didn't go to school to be a writer I mean I just you know I love to write I've taken in college which is you know 20 plus years ago creative writing classes and whatnot and I obviously was uh, you know a business professional so writing press releases and whatever but um do you find like a lot of the people that you're working with are more like people that went to school for literature or do you find like there's people like me that are like I just like to write anybody can write and I'm just doing it (laughs) it's that's the people that come to me it's okay. because it's really interesting because on LinkedIn um I'm quite active on LinkedIn and I'll sometimes get connection requests from people you know uh, such and such a person who works at an environmental agency and whoever else who works in aeronautics okay why do they want to connect with me and it's so difficult to know whether to click accept because Mm -hmm. they could be the person that drops me a message that says I do have a day job but I'm writing this novel (laughs) um you know and and we kind of connect that way um so I get a lot of people who are the and actually who've come to it later in life um I worked with a couple of have I let's have a think this was quite a while ago I've worked with a couple of writers in their early 20s Okay. Um, but I tend to work with the ones who have had the day job. They've done. Some of them still are doing the corporate thing. Some of them are squirreling away, trying to write at weekends. They get up at four a.m. or whatever. But they want out. They want out of the corporate rat race. They want out of that, and they want to make a living from their writing. Um, but like this is again, it's it's the whole aligning because that was like me with teaching. I had to work so hard while I was teaching full time and also started to retrain. There aren't enough hours in the week anyway to be a teacher. So to suddenly say I'm going to go back to school and study how to be a proofreader first and then an editor, I had to, I had to find those hours in order mm-hmm. to do that studying. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I did it and I made it work. So I really understand the indie authors who they're still working full time, but they are writing. And in an ideal world, what they hope to do is to be able to eventually support themselves from their from their books, you know. Do you so like once you've done um, editing and the, the you guys go your separate ways and do you follow what happens with the book typically or are you getting too busy to do that or? Um. I am connected to most of my author clients on either LinkedIn or Facebook, the occasional person on Instagram and and so on. So it's quite nice to just be in the general sort of, depending on the algorithm, as we've mentioned, Uh but to just kind of see the occasional post about what they're up to and that's always fun so when so when they've got their books out on these blog tours tours sorry pronunciation I don't don't know if you caught that one but the blog tours that um people you know everyone gets their books uh, read by bloggers and and so on or 
um, they get a book bub promotion on it, or they, you know, whatever they're doing as their marketing efforts, or they've had a brilliant Goodreads review and they're selling uh, and they're sharing that. It's always nice to see. So I follow it in that regard to mm -hmm. just to it's it, it is nice to see where they go from you know from their um with their with their books and, and what happens next. Now, one thing I will say is that I would I would never. I always I like to support the people that I've worked with. I like to um, you know see what they're up to online. I'll throw them a like and I'll share and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't write them a book review uh, because oh, I feel yeah. like there's an ethical line there. So so I, I'm not going to you know support an author in that way to kind of fire a good review their way because I don't think that's ethically right. But I I love sort of seeing what they're up to. I love what. I actually really love reading the reviews <laughs> oh, <that's awesome. laughs> because you know yeah because I think okay and I also think it's not a bad thing for me as well because not all reviews are positive mm, yeah. I mean it, there's always going to be the occasional one isn't there and and I think well actually it's good for me as well to see it's been good for my professional development to see what readers like and what they don't like so mm. I yeah, that's really insightful of... of you. I like that you do that. Well, I just think I could do with knowing this, really. Yeah. Well, it, kind of, it also kind of creates that more that bondedness between you and your author, because like you, you realize that your energy is part of the book and that you helped play a part in whatever review yeah. that they received. So, I mean, not yeah. necessarily like the storyline or the plot line, but like you yeah. said, you, you know, you mentioned a couple of times with my book, your job was to enhance it. And you did, you know, like, so, yeah. 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 No, so I, I, I do. I, I like to kind of see what they're up to. There's one or two authors who maybe aren't doing so much writing at the moment or their life has changed in some way or other. So they've kind of dropped off and I'm not really sure what they're up to anymore. But yeah, there's a key kind of group of authors where I sort of see what they're up to in the general social media world. Yeah. <laughs> or in it, fact, I might be on their mailing list. I quite like to be on an author mailing list to see what yeah. they're up to as well. That's quite nice. Yeah. Then you don't have to worry about those the rhythms. But so, yeah, it, it seems like you do have a lot of like, because when I went in and read your testimonies before, you know, even I think even reaching out to you, I was reading your testimonies first. Um, it seemed to me that you had a lot of uh, client. one clients had great things to say about you, but you had repeat clients like yeah that that you improved their work so much that they came back for the second one you know like so that's I mean I really think I love that good. and you know the style sheet that I sent you with your mm -hmm. edit which for the listeners is almost like a bible that goes with your first novel and we can kind of continue building on it as, as we get into your second so it's got the character details it's got the geography it's got you know keeping tabs mm -hmm. and so on and I love coming back to a second book working with the same author in the same series because oh look there's the style sheet and I can check from before you know what Flan looked like last time make sure his hair's still the same in book two yeah. um it's <laughs> it's um it's really nice to revisit characters and and kind of um and see more of them and, and learn more about their stories, I suppose. And I'm using it too. So for all of the um, authors out there, even when I'm writing book two, I'm like, now, is this one of the words that is capitalized or not capitalized? And I'll go back to your style sheet and double check it. Because it's useful details that I want to remember, you know? So yeah, yeah it's, it's good. Um, I wouldn't like to edit with without completing a style sheet to go to go with an edit you know it's um it's my safety blanket <laughs> and I actually looked at our style sheet before this interview because obviously since I did your I think I sent yours back on like November the 30th I think yeah, um you. and I've done several books since then even though we're only on the 10th of January I don't know I've been really busy and so I was just refreshing myself reminding myself so it's nice as a little recap yeah. To look back well, to this and you're doing sheet. my prologue because I changed my mind and decided to add. Oh, yeah. It. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Should I favorite. have a prologue? Should I not have a prologue yet? <laughs> you know, I know this is a side topic, but again, I decided to add the prologue because I was like, I started getting paranoid that maybe people will think this is like a bait and switch. And so I was like, I, I'm going to keep the prologue in here because this is my intention, but I don't know how well it came across. 
So like when I have these discussions with my sister and I'll be talking to her and be like, well, did you think this or this? And she'll be like, no. And I'm like, well, you're not finished reading the story. So come back to me. You know? Yeah, and wait so, till you've like, got to the end. Wait till, has she got to the end now? No, she hasn't. I mean, she's a school teacher. And so, oh, she, well, yeah. I understand that then. <laughs> she yeah, has exactly. no time. <laughs> she has no time, but during the, the like the winter break and um, she, she's in Florida. So hurricane season, she was able to read a lot during those times, but then she's back in school and just, there's no time, you know, like there's always little things that she has to do to prep and like, it's like having two jobs, you know, yeah. you got your teaching job and then you got your home and prepping job. So um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, there's one other question I know I wanted to ask you and I know we're getting long, so we need to kind of wrap up. Um, oh, I was, I guess I wanted to ask, like, do you have a like blog? Cause like, you know, like for me, like sometimes mm, I'm just going to share my perspective, right? I didn't go to writing school. I didn't go to writing classes. I didn't go to like any things like that. And so like when I first started talking about my book, like somebody came up to me and was like, well, is this a, like a, you know urban fantasy is this a romantic yeah, yeah. fantasy is this a paranoia and I was like I don't know what these words mean should I know what they mean now <laughs> since I have and I keep learning more things it is like unbelievable like I didn't yeah. like somebody came up to me and was like well what's your top tropes and I'm like what's yeah. the trope mean like oh, sometimes gosh. I wish there was like you know um places to go for the people that aren't in, in the writing world but I like that's what I said to the people I'm like when I pick up a book I don't pick up a book and say does it have these tropes does it have yeah but some urban? readers do you know some but readers yeah, so. yeah especially romance readers they they want enemies to lovers and they want enemies to lovers every time yes and don't I mean, pressure, okay you'll die <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's but yeah it's um it's a whole new vocabulary to learn isn't it yeah I've had to you know and like I know you're an editor and you're like you're so into this so like sometimes I'm like I wish I could go ask Claire these things and I'm like well do you know um I like to be a sounding board for um for authors because as I said I know the world really well because I think that if I had just come at this new phase of my life as an editor, as a proofreader, but that I didn't know about, I don't know, let's say draft to digital or formatting a manuscript or marketing a book, or I kind of know about all of the things around the edge because of what my husband John does. So I usually have the answer to the, the questions. And if I don't know the answer, then I usually can point you to a, a Facebook group or a blog or a resource. So, yeah, that's a, something that I hope that your listeners, if they do look me up online, I I, I'm, I don't mind being that sounding board. I can't answer everything and I can't always promise to have time to give detailed responses. But if it's just firing you a quick link, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, you helped me so, with the spice thing. I understand a we, lot more Yeah, now. we did a little bit of spice research, didn't we, together to, yes. uh, <laughs> you know, to understand like how spicy there's this uh, like paranoia of like, I don't want to mislead people. And like my, uh, to me, <laughs> this is my opinion, but my book to me is unique. Like maybe there are some things that are common for all the books out there. And so sometimes I'm like, well, you know, like, like let's say enemies to lovers. I'm like, I can't call this enemies to lovers because they're just two people who started off on a wrong foot and have this major dislike for each other. Can it be dislike to interest? Because butting heads is considered enemies. But then for other people, enemies means like, no, we're like at war with each other. It's my life versus your life, like that type of enemies. And then you get into this, like. It's really, it's interesting because I'm just looking at, what, at something I wrote down earlier about the difference between romantic fantasy and fantasy romance. Ooh. If you're if you're telling if you're telling your readers that your book is fantasy romance you've got to give them a happily ever after oh. or they won't so if you're not giving them a, um, a a happy ever after then you then call it a romantic fantasy hmm. not a fantasy romance that's like okay. oh my gosh I'm gonna have to write that down because those two words like that goes into my dyslexia and I just like and oh. you've already switched it around yep. yeah yep yep 
yeah so I'll, I'll message I'll send this to you on a message afterwards but romantic fantasy you could have something like a high fantasy with a romance subplot so I was thinking about this because I was thinking about Sabina in your story and it was like what are we more invested in are we invested in her kind of quest and her sort of development or are we more invested in I don't want to give anything away but um sort of a, a, a romance storyline or so on but so I won't say too much but you have a think about whether which one is the most prominent you know is it more about the quest is it more about the um development of that character is it more about the the a, a romance is it not so yeah do you know what I think about though for some reason this is how strange my brain works I think well it's like dirty dancing <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Nobody brings a watermelon, Ashley. Don't market it like that, or they'll be waiting for a watermelon. <laughs> Story is all about her having this challenge with her father. Like he's your yeah. antagonist in this like story, and she's wanting to be who she is regardless, and she wants him to love her, right? And that yeah. is the story. And the story takes place through I'm gonna step in and learn how to dance because this is exciting and this. Like I, I have a purpose. I have a role. I can help here. Like whatever she steps in and does this and the story would exist without Patrick Swayze and her becoming an item, but it makes it like, it makes the story so freaking great because they could have just, I'm, I'm the reason I think of dirty dancing is because my husband and I do ballroom dancing and like swing yeah, dancing yeah, yeah. and all of this stuff. And so I know you can have partners that are not even sexually like in the same category, regardless of what gender they are, you know, like they, they could be yeah. the same genders dancing with each other and they could have nothing towards each other. You know what I mean? And, and so you can have partners in dancing that emulate this intimacy, you know, that look great on the dance floor, but they have nothing towards each other. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the in dirty dancing that they came together because they could have just kept fighting with each other and butting heads and um, not created that romantic connection, that intimacy. And it, the story would have been, the story still would have been complete, but the romance like brought it up, major novel, yeah. you know? And so like, that's what I really think about like my book, you know, like the story could have existed without this drama. Without a romance. Of, mm -hmm. But boy, does it really... Yeah, but if it could have existed without the romance, then I think that you know that the romance is secondary. Yeah. So I think you want to be calling it a romantic fantasy okay. and not a fantasy romance. It's so weird. I mean, so again, I'm like, why would you start off with romantic? Because then that means... Oh, I know. <laughs> That's coming first. I, I understand that. I, I get that as well. Well, anyway, you're a but world yeah. of information. I think that if you ever do start a blog, you'll have all of these great things to bring. I to do have a blog. Time. I do have a blog okay. at cherryedits.com. I, I do blog there. But the mailing list, yes, I'm the mailing list. Watch out for that because um, 1st of February, I'm going to hopefully launch the mailing list. So that'll be a good way to keep in touch as well. Yeah, that's super exciting. And I'm so glad to have you on this podcast and to learn so much from you and to be able to get to work with you. And even though I want to keep Claire all to myself, <laughs> like, <laughs> please go and check her out because she's amazing and she's fast and she's efficient and easy to work with. And just, I can't say enough glowing, wonderful things about her. And I hope you learned a lot from listening today. Is there anything that you want to tell future you know, clients or authors out there or editors even, because, you know, sometimes just speaking your, to your editors is good. Um, authors, just write that book, just get it written, you know, have confidence, just push forward and challenge those inner thoughts that are preventing you from getting this book out. Just get it written you know, so authors just, just write, write, write. And um, I don't know, other editors, I love being part of the editing community. And what I really like about it is that we all, we're all different. So, you know, it's so important, important for authors to check out editors. And it might be that I'm the editor for you, and it might be that I'm not, and that's both equally valid. And that's absolutely fine. So just 
connect you know get some editors in your network see have a look them up on linkedin look them up on facebook look them up wherever you hang out and i would just say see what you make of um of the editors do you like the the sense you're getting of them do you like the feel of them do you like the, the way their personality comes across because i think that getting that connection really really helps so yeah, yeah. That's and i it, really I would just say too, to kind of back that up is that um, when I chose Claire, I was willing to pay the conversion rate. So I actually spent hundreds of dollars more just to work with her. That's how good <laughs> she is. Okay, people, <laughs> I'm just telling you. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much, Ashley. I just think the stars must have aligned because this is wonderful it's been such a great experience oh, thank you well I'm so glad to have you in my life and to work with you to everybody listening thank you for hanging on till the end please reach out to <laughs> either one of us and letting us know what questions you have or if you want to work with Claire I guess I will share her <laughs> anyway get in line <laughs> yeah, exactly. all right everyone you matter and I will see you next week